Well, good morning, everyone. It's me again. I uh, was not spec- expecting to be here this morning, uh, or I, was, I would have been here, but doing something else. Um, Chris Irwin texted me Friday night and was, and was like, hey, I'm supposed to preach Sunday, and we've had two flights canceled on us. I'm like, okay, let me know. I'm, I can back you up. He, then he texted me back Saturday morning. He was like, yeah, you're going to need to back me up because <laughs> we still haven't been able to get a flight out. So uh, apparently they are on the way and hopefully uh, very, very close and we're looking forward to hearing all that God did for them uh, and through them on their trip. I'm excited about that. But uh, for today, you had to go to the end of the bench uh, and, and pull me in. Uh, my, uh, my f- reminds me a lot of my high school basketball career, actually. So <laughs> my, uh, my friends called me the 50-50-50 player. He said if we were up by 50 points or down by 50 points and there were 50 seconds left in the game, I might get to see a little bit of playing time. But... Uh, Other than that, I was usually near the end of the bench. Uh, But uh, this morning we're going to talk about a subject that, you know, is kind of getting rare in the church, Uh, and that's the subject of sin. You know, so many uh, churches have almost developed it as a marketing strategy to not ever talk about sin, to uh, only talk about, you know, fun things, encouraging things, because that's going to bring people in and it's not going to offend anybody. And, and I, think, I think that's a huge error to skip over the subject of sin. Uh, but I also think it's a huge error when we talk about sin and we don't talk about it in a biblical, godly way. So hopefully we'll uh, be able to accomplish that this morning. Uh, a lot of times when I think about the word sin, I, I go back to when I was about 13, 14 years old, and our church, uh, I was a preacher's kid, our church was having a VBS, that was back in the days when VBS was two weeks long, and they, the, they had a teacher for the two and three year olds for the first week, but they didn't have a teacher for the two and three year olds for the second week. And so I got voluntold to uh, show up uh, every day for the last week, and as a 13 year old kid, I was there to show up and help teach the two and three year olds, which was terrifying. <laughs> and um, there was a kid in this class, I'll never forget it. His name, no, no lie, his name was Aaron Sin. And he lived up to his name. Uh, here's, here's what Aaron Sin did. Actually, his dad was a doctor, Dr. Sin, which... <laughs> Sounds like a, a Batman villain from the old 60s thing. Uh, I'm not sure I would have gone to him as a doctor. Uh, but Aaron Sin, at two, three years old, you know, VBS time comes around. You get the little Dixie cups full of red Kool-Aid. You get a couple of cookies on a napkin. And my little two- and three-year-olds are sitting at this little low table, and they're starting to get their snack. Aaron Sin went around the table, did this, and then dipped his hand into everybody's Kool-Aid cup all around the table. And then he said, you're not going to drink that now, right? So he, he knew what he was doing. He was trying to get all the Kool-Aid by making it so gross that none of the other kids would want to drink it. Uh, so I don't know what happened to Aronson after that, uh, but I always think of, of that. Uh, I always think of him when I have a, a discussion about the word sin. Uh, but sin is a... Uh, you know, we talked about love last week, and there's a lot of different words that that we all translate love. There's a lot of different words in Scripture for sin, and they, they have some different meanings. Some of them are used fairly interchangeably at times, and some of them are a little bit more specific to, um, to an individual situation. So I want to go through and talk about some of the different meanings uh, for the word sin that we might call sin or translate sin. Uh, the first one is missing the mark. Uh, Romans 6.23 says, all, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. This is an idea that you are trying, you are aiming, you're doing your best to do everything that you're supposed to do, but sometimes you just don't do it. Sometimes you fall short of the glory of God. He's, he's got a perfect standard, and if you miss that perfect standard with your own life, the way you live... Uh, then you've sinned. Uh, you have fallen short of the glory of God. 
Uh, Steph Curry is the best free throw shooter to ever play the game on the NBA level. And out of every 10 times he takes a free throw shot, he misses one of them. Uh, he's at about 91% right now for his career. And so out of every 10, he's missing about one, and he's the best to ever do it. He's aiming for the goal. He sees the target. He knows what he's supposed to do. He's practiced it over and over again, uh, but he's not perfect. And I think that's one of the ways that we look at ourselves for, with in the idea of sin is that we can know what we're supposed to do. We can do our best to do that, uh, but we are also human, and we uh, lose our focus from time to time. We get distracted. You know, in basketball, they do everything they can behind the goal to make you think and, and look in the wrong direction. Uh, we have a whole world that's doing that for us, and sometimes we do fall short of God's perfect standard, uh, even though we're trying our best. Uh, but when we fall short of God's perfect standard, we still fall short of God's perfect standard. Uh, it is still sin. It is n us not living up to what God has uh, told us is our best path. Uh, a second one that we will see in Scripture is the idea of drifting away. A lot of times this idea is translated trespasses in some of the older translations. Hebrews 2.1 says, Therefore, we must pay more closer or pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. And this is the idea of you, you don't really show up and decide, today I'm going to walk away from God. Today is the day that I'm, I'm, I'm just going to give it all up and I'm going to give myself a hall pass and I'm going to go off and do whatever I want to for a while and just go party and celebrate, you know, kind of the prodigal son idea. You know, there are people who do that. There are people who, you know, walk away for a while and, uh, or walk away permanently even. But I think a lot of times what we do is we drift away. Uh, and drifting is a case where it's, you, you don't really realize it because you're not paying close enough attention. And when I think of this style of sin, this type of sin, I always think of when the years when I grew up and we had family vacations at the beach. And I, you know, I was one that was always in the water. My brothers, my parents, they'd sit out and for a while, but if I was at the beach, I was in the water as much as I possibly could. And what I had to do was pay attention to where my parents were sitting on the beach because the current, uh, sometimes it was really strong, sometimes it was fairly subtle, but I'd be playing around, I'd be you know, boogie boarding, I'd be doing all that, but then I would look up and not recognize where I was. And, and it's not because I chose to wander down the beach, but it's because I wasn't paying attention to the current that I was caught up in. And I would have to get out and figure out where I was, walk down the beach, get back into a place where I can see my parents, get back in the water, and, you know, repeat, repeat, repeat uh, all day long as I was getting out to, to get myself back where I was. But it's a drifting away. It's not a, uh, and, and I think this is one of the things I think we do a lot of, is we we're just lose our focus. We're not paying attention. We're not fighting against the current of the community around us, of the culture around us. And if we're not really putting in an effort to stay close to home base, close to our Lord and Savior, uh, we can find ourselves down the beach a ways. And hopefully we can make those corrections quickly and get back into position. Uh, but sometimes that current's stronger than we knew, and we could be much farther away from God than we would have ever thought. A uh, third one uh, that we see in Scripture is the idea of avoiding the good. Sometimes we call this the sin of omission instead of commission. It's not something we're doing. It's something we're not doing. Uh, James 4, 17 says, Whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. And I don't like to think about this one too awful much because I'm pretty good at avoiding doing things. And uh, I there are times when you, you just know this is the right thing to do. I really need to go speak to that person. Uh, or I really need to fix this thing in my life. Or I really need to you know, reach out and, and encourage so-and-so. And, and in the process, you just, you don't. Uh, for me, being naturally an introvert, uh, it, it's sometimes very hard to, for me to pick up the phone and make the phone call that I know I ought to make to encourage someone or to be a blessing to someone uh, or to challenge someone. 
Uh, and so sometimes it's just the, the good thing that we know we ought to do, and for whatever reason we choose not to do it. Uh, that's avoiding the good. That's the sin of omission. Uh, next one I, you see in Scripture is transgressions, and that's the idea of crossing the line. Uh, in this case, I, I think of, you know, like the basketball court, which I usually saw from the bench again. Uh, but you think of that basketball court, there's a border around it, and there are things that can take place inside the border, and there are things that can't take place outside the border. If I'm dribbling the ball and I step on that line or if I cross that line, uh, I lose it. You know, that's, that's a penalty. I have to turn the ball over to the other team. Uh, in the idea of transgressions, it's the idea that God has given us clear boundaries for our life. Not because he wants to cage us in, not because he wants to steal our joy, uh, but because those lines are our protections. Uh, those lines are the guardrails on the highway that, that keep us from you know, going, w going off the edge and hurting ourselves, hurting other people. And in Psalm 51.3, it says, For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Uh, the psalmist here is saying, I know where the borders are, uh, but I know that I'm not so good at keeping those borders as my borders. Uh, we look for excuses. We look for uh, opportunities to step over that line sometimes. And then the, one of the big ones, one of the, the really intense words is the idea of rebellion. And that's when we choose to take God's place. Uh, scripture says, you know, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be, my, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Uh, but so often we say, yeah, our Father's up in heaven, but I think I'm going to be on the throne for, for a little while. It's my will be done. I really want this. I know it's not the best. I know God has better things for me, but I really want it, and I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, I, I don't care what God says about this. Uh, in Isaiah 4, 13 through 14, you have the reason Satan lost his place in heaven. Uh, the, Isaiah says, you said, you said in your heart, speaking to you know, Satan, the fallen angel, uh, you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. You know, so rebellion is when we say, God, I want to be in control of my own life. I want to call my own shots. I know you're there, but I don't care. I, I want to do it my way. Uh, we see this uh, over and over again. We see, it, we see rebellion in the Garden of Eden. Uh, God, I know what you've said about that tree that I'm not supposed to eat of. But I've got some other ideas. You know, this, this serpent over here is telling me that this is going to make me smart. This is going to make me powerful. This is going to make me live forever. So I know what God said, but I'm going to ignore it because I want what this is going to give me. And this is a, you know, scripturally, throughout scripture, this is the word that is used for some of the harshest of all the sins. In Samuel, when uh, King Saul is losing his authority in the land because of his sinfulness. Uh, he goes and, and contacts a witch so that the witch can bring up his old mentor, Samuel, to give him some advice. Uh, and scripture tells us in that place that witchcraft is as the sin of rebellion. So, you know, trying to reach into the, the afterworld, try to find power, strength, wisdom in any place other than God is an act of rebellion against him. And so you have all these things. You have, you have a sin that says, I'm trying really hard, but I'm just not good enough. And then you have an, the other extreme of rebellion where it says, I'm not even really trying at this point. I, I know what God wants for me. I'm going my own path. And so you've got a range of sin. And a lot of times we say, you know, all sin is the same. And and that's true in some senses, but it's also not exactly true in other senses. Uh, the result of the sin is the same. And so we get to, uh, you know, the old good news, bad news thing. Do you want the good news first or the bad news? I'm going to give you the bad news first. And in Romans, it tells us that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. 
Uh, so the bad news is as I've sinned, you've sinned, everyone in this room has sinned, everybody who's going down Cedar Lane not showing up to church today, they're sinning too. Uh, we're all sinners, and we've all fallen short of the, the glory of God. Uh, rather than go to the good news is, next, let's go to the worst news. The worst news is, for the wages of sin is death. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But Paul also writes to the Romans and says, for the wages of sin is death. That means, you know, a wage is something that you earn. I go to work, I do my job, at a couple times a month, they put a paycheck in my bank account, and, and they don't have really a choice whether they want to do that. You know, that's what I've earned. That's part of the deal that we agreed to at the very beginning. And so the wage that I earn when I sin, and again, I have sinned, all of us have, for all have sinned and fallen short of, fallen short of the glory of God. Uh, the worst news is that we all deserve death because of sin. And that could be because you tried really hard but still messed up. Or that could be because you said, God, I don't want anything to do with you right now. I'm going to be on the throne of my own life. I'm going to call my own shots. I'm going to be my own boss. And I'm going to be in charge. And I don't care what you want. I'm going to do it my way. Whether you're on one end of the scale or the other with your sin, we all deserve death. And that's the worst news. Now the good news Paul doesn't finish with the wages of sin is death. He says, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So the, the answer to sin is the grace of Jesus Christ, that he would die in our place, that he would pay the wage that we owed because of our sin, that he would take that penalty, that punishment. Uh, it's as if I present my report card uh, and I've got F's all over it. And Jesus, of course, is perfect. He's got all A++ on his report card. Uh, but then he takes my report card, he erases my name, writes his name on top, and re reports that. And Jesus reports his report card full of sin, which is not his sin, but my sin. But he's taken it on himself and signed his name on it so that he can present the, before the Father, this person is clean. Look, they've got an A++ report card because that's what I've done for them. When, uh, when we think about sin, uh, I've heard so many times, even here just recently, of people saying, oh, I, I used to go to church, but I was hurt by the church. Uh, that seems to be a common phrase going around for people who are, not going to church is that they were hurt by it or they're I've heard people say I've got a, a brother or a sister or a family member that I can't get to go to church in, anymore because when they were growing up they were so hurt by the church and I, I believe it you know I believe that the church has hurt people I've been hurt by the church uh, we've all probably had times when uh, we are in a community of people who have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, there's going to be times when we're disappointed. Uh, there's going to be times when we disappoint others. Uh, and we're, we have this, you know, kind of burden of being the body of Christ, but at the same time not being as good as Christ and falling short of his perfect standard and having a difficult time ministering to people uh, when we ourselves are fallen and need ministering to and it becomes a, a very difficult situation in a lot of ways. And so when we think about dealing with sin, we, we often categorize how we're going to deal with it depending on who we're going to deal with. Uh, when I'm dealing with my sin, uh, I could either, and sometimes I have done both of these, uh, sometimes I will beat myself up over my sin and say, God can't use me, he, I'm no good, I'll never be useful, I can never be a part of the kingdom because I've messed up too many times. Or, what I often, probably more often do, is I excuse my sin and say, oh, well, yeah, I know I shouldn't have done that, but there's really good reasons for it. And I start pulling out the excuse cards and, and say, oh, well, yeah, yeah, I probably shouldn't have done that, but there, was, there were circumstances that made it the best choice. Uh, and it's, it's kind of like the way we drive sometimes. Everybody who drives faster than me is a maniac. Everybody who drives slower than me is an idiot. 
everybody should drive exactly the way I drive, even if I'm not exactly following all the rules while I'm driving. Like maybe I'm five or six or seven miles over the speed limit myself, uh, but the guy goes by me, oh, I can't believe that guy's doing that, or the person who slows me down, I can't believe they're not going faster. Uh, that's kind of the way we do with ourselves. Sometimes we make those excuses. Uh, and then, so it's, but it's not just my sin I have to deal with. Because I'm part of the body of Christ, I, I have to deal with your sin, and you have to deal with my sin as the, the church itself. And I think this is where people leave the church saying the church is too hurtful and too judgmental because uh, it's easy for me to excuse my sin but beat one of you up over your sins. Uh, and we, so we give, set a different set of standards for my sin versus your sin. And people have been hurt by being beat up because they've messed up. Where, where I love grace for myself, I, I love judgment for the person that, that maybe has hurt me within the church. And, and that becomes a very tricky balance that we have to take. And then there's their sin, you know, my sin is my sin, your sin is the church, their sin is people outside the church. And what do we do with their sin? And again, the church has got a, a reputation of being judgmental and legalistic and harsh and cruel to those outside the church. And, and again, scripturally, there's, there is some things. If you look at how Jesus dealt with sin, he was much more harsh with the Pharisees who claimed to be religious leaders than he was with you know, the woman caught in adultery, who he just says, I'm not judging you either, go and sin no more. Uh, but to the Pharisees, you brood of vipers, you, you snake pit full of, you know, good for nothing. You know, he, was, he went after the, the Pharisees, and he was much more gentle with those outside the church. Uh, but here's, here's what I think, and, you know, rather, we can get into the deep weeds on exactly all the different subtleties in here. But, but let me give you one answer instead of, you know, a flow chart of how to deal with sin for whoever you happen to deal with. Let me give you one answer. It's Jesus Christ. He is the only answer to our sin, whether it's my sin, your sin, or their sin. Jesus Christ is the only answer. He is our Savior. He is the one who gave his life to wash away our sins. Uh, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So whether you're dealing with a sin that maybe is a sin habit for you, one that you've struggled with and are having a hard time getting under control in your life, uh, whether there's someone in your close circle, a family member, a friend, a, a church friend that uh, you know is struggling with something, um, that they're not, they're not hitting the mark as often as, as maybe they should. Uh, or if you're dealing with somebody who's outside the church who, who doesn't know any better, uh, the answer is I don't think ever going to be found in harshness. It's not going to be found in judgment. It's not going to be found in uh, trying to control somebody else when we can't even control ourselves most of the time. The answer is always going to be Jesus Christ. He is the answer to sin. He's the solution. He's the only solution. If we didn't, uh, if there was another way, then God would have said to Jesus when he was saying, Lord, help this cup pass for me. If there's any other way for this to happen. Uh, God didn't say that to him. The Father didn't give him a, oh, if, if they just try harder, or, or if they just have the, the right Bible study, if they just say the prayer with the right words in the right place, God didn't say any of that. He said, Jesus, you are going to be the answer. You've got to go through this, this sacrifice because it's the only way for them to have their sins washed away. As the worship team comes on up, I just want to, uh, I want to as we sing, uh, give you an opportunity. If, if you've felt beat up by the church, uh, if you've excused your own sin too often, or if you've beat yourself up too, ex too harshly over your own sin too often, uh, if you uh, have somebody in your family that, that you want to have wisdom on how to approach about their sin and uh, how to share Christ in a, a loving but truthful way, uh, if you have any of those things that you'd like to, 
to pray about this afternoon or this morning. I'm going to have a couple of the elders uh, come up, and uh, if you want to come up and have a little bit of uh, private prayer time with them, they're more than willing and happy to, to come up and pray with you, pray for you, and just give you an opportunity to, uh, to approach the throne of, of grace, to approach Jesus Christ, and seek his forgiveness, seek his help in your sins. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, uh, forgive us for the times when we thought we could control it ourselves, when we, where we can control others. Uh, help us to, Lord, keep our eyes on you at all times. And Lord, I just pray that each of us will be challenged and convicted to, uh, to center you in our lives and not do it in our own strength anymore. Uh, Lord, I just pray that if anybody's heart is in their own pew, if they don't want to come up, Lord, that they would spend this this last few minutes with you talking about it or praying with, uh, with one of our friends up here in the front. Uh, I pray, Lord, that you would open that heart for them to, to see you as their Lord and Savior. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.